Welcome back, everyone. I'm the Bad Luck Gamer, and apologize, my hair is a little bit of a mess. It's I'm gonna need cut soon, so don't worry, I'll look good soon. But today's video is actually gonna be based on something that one I've been using my research tab on my uh, YouTube creators tab to see what you're all looking for, and two, I think this is actually just a great time to do this as the remaster is coming up and pretty much. Everything in the remaster has been more or less revealed sans some feats from some of the classes that are getting a little bit of a change up like the witch. So I'm going to be doing a current 2023 to 2024 updated version of how to make a character. I'm doing a character creation guide for Pathfinder 2nd edition and also two in one. We're doing a path builder. Uh, we're doing a path builder walkthrough as well as path builder is what I would say the best character creation tool openly available to everyone online. So I do recommend that if you are starting path on the first time you use path builder as it gives you a step by step for everything you want to do in the game. But I will also explain some of the stuff that you might come across if you're just doing this native using the character sheet. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So you can tell that this is either an Android app, there's no iPhone uh, access for this one currently, or you can do it on the web. Now for the purpose of this video, we're gonna be doing it on the web. So we're gonna hop over and you'll go to, I was working on a character already, so this is what, isn't what it'll look like for your first character. But easy enough, you just go over here to new character and you can look over character options and you can access all kinds of things. I'm going to click get started here. This just gives you the flat generic template that they give you automatically. You can see that you start off as a human barkeeper fighter. Obviously, you're going to be able to change this. But let's look at those character options that we mentioned before. So character options. You can see what you have access to, which is in these top two options. This this top option is kind of the most generic. There's not a lot here that you should worry about in your first game. There's a lot of half orc and half elf for all ancestries, which is an interesting variant rule. Not a lot of people even worry about it, but it is there. There's also display rare aftermath and deviant feats for your first character. I don't recommend this one. And Aftermath and Deviant feats are for characters who have run-ins with unique creatures, so they're not anything you're going to be starting off the game with anyway. You can also see some dice options, because you can do dice rolling in here, and you can see some advanced options. Now, in order to get access to these advanced options, you're going to actually need to buy the Pro Path Builder Edition, which is $6. It's not necessary but it does offer some things that are going to be difficult to do on the sheet otherwise. Not that it's not possible, but it comes with a lot of extra functionality. Um, one of the biggest ones is free archetype. This is probably one of the most commonly used rules in the game. Oh, it clicked it automatically. Uh, as you can see here, you can see my email, that's fine. Uh, it is $6 here. And six dollars US, five ninety nine US. I don't know if there's tax included. It's a one time payment. And there's no subscription, so you don't have to worry about it. It's only six dollars, but if you don't want to pay six dollars, you absolutely don't have to. Free archetype is the one that I would say is the biggest reason why you would pick it up. But as well, you can add the ancestry paragon rules, gradual ability boosts. Uh, you can remove level to proficiency, which is something I'll explain in a moment. Uh, a lot of these you're not going to have to worry about unless the GM is telling you you need to worry about it. And even then, a lot of them can just be added to your character sheet anyway. So it's not actually that big a deal. But for the sake and purpose, I have this on my phone, so I don't need to buy it online. I'm just going to go ahead and continue on. It's absolutely not necessary for the sake of this uh, show. So. First, you're going to go through the ABCs of character creation, the ancestry background class, though I do recommend selecting your class first 
as to what you want to play. So when you finally select what class you want, you're going to come over here to this list and you're going to select one. Now I will mention that you'll see these icons and they're going to be different colors and you're going to see this for a lot of different options. Now these icons, when they're just the standard kind of like bluish gray, that's common. That means you don't have to worry about any selecting it. It's okay by the rules and standard. Now, if they're yellow, yellowy gold in this way, that means they're uncommon. Uncommon isn't a factor of power, but more or less is a factor of lore reasons. Typically, most uncommon choices in the game might clash with some GM's ideas of the game. For instance, the gunslinger and the inventor utilize technology that your GM might not want for their games. But if you're looking at overall class balance, it's not going to be more or less powerful. Also, with the release of the Exemplar coming next year, we're going to have our first rare class. And again, that one is not more powerful, in my opinion, but it does have some interesting lore implications as your character is essentially a demigod. So in any regard, whenever there is these gold options or deep blue, which I'll show you in a moment, you're going to want to ask your GM for permission to use that option. Typically, they'll say yes, but if they say no, you'll need to respect their decision or maybe determine if that table is even right for you in the first place. So when you look at the class options here, you're going to see a general rundown of the class followed by their key ability score. So ability scores are going to be your innate modifiers that you're going to add to relevant checks. For instance, when you're lifting stuff up, you're going to be using strength. And if you're doing acrobatics, you're probably going to be rolling your dex modifier to it. So your key ability is the core ability that your class utilizes the most. It also is the free boost that you're going to add to your class or to your character. So you need to keep that in mind. And I'll get to boost here in just a moment, but let's finish talking about what the class offers. So the hit points is what you're going to add to your class every level you have. So starting off at level one, you're going to add your hit points here plus your con modifier. And then when you level up, you're going to add this same value plus your con modifier again. So it's really important that you understand how much HP you have. And of course, as I mentioned before, you're going to be using your constitution ability score modifier. So when you add to you that modifier, it retroactively adds for each level you already have. So if we say at level five, you get your ability boost and you increase your con, you will increase your health by five points, one for each level for the increase that you got, unless you are somehow starting with a 18, which then you'll actually only get like half a point or sorry, not 18 a plus four, and then you only get like half a point. It's a little confusing, but just know when you get up to plus four modifier, every plus one after that is going to require two boosts. So the only class you have to worry about that is the kineticist that uses its constitution as its key ability. So for most other classes, it's not something you're going to have to worry about. Uh, then you're going to see your various trained proficiencies here. Now. Your proficiency in the game is a modifier that is equal to the proficiency of your skill. So, for instance, if you're trained, it's plus two. Or if you're expert, it's plus four. It gets all the way up to legendary, which is plus eight. And it adds your current level. So starting off at level one, your trained proficiency is going to give you plus three plus the relevant skill for the sake of perception, it'll use wisdom. If it's expert, it will be plus five plus relevant ability score, which in this case would be will, which is also wisdom. So all you're, you're off to a good start. Now, saving throws are based on the fortitude reflex or will fortitude is anything that affects as your character's general like health, constitution, diseases, all that kind of stuff or things that might force your character to move. This uses the constitution ability. 
the trained in re or sorry reflex uses is anything about avoiding or evading a explosion or anything like that it uses your dex ability score and will is anything that affects your character's mental abilities or faculties and that is going to use wisdom now you also get skill proficiencies and as you can see with the cleric it has a unique factor where you get one skill determined by your choice of deity plus religion plus two plus your intelligence modifier so intelligence will give you extra skills the higher your intelligence modifier is something that's very important to keep in uh, keep track of as well each class will get a different amount based on their intelligence and also kind of based on what they get since cleric does get additional skills based on their deity uh, it says one skill here you will get an additional skill on top of the religion and two plus intelligence modifier this is the huge area and probably one of the most important is your attack modifiers. Now you can see that you're trained in simple weapons and trained in the favored weapon of your deity. This is no matter if you're a war priest or cleric cloister priest as well. Uh, if your deity's favorite weapon is uncommon, you also gain access to it. So I did mention the uncommon, the gold modifiers over here. This automatically without needing to get permission from your GM gives you access to that favored weapon so that's something that's important to mention though it's also important to mention to your gm just in case they might not like it for whatever reason uh you also gain access to all right sorry i read that uh and then all classes whether it's a wizard or a fighter are trained in unarmed attacks so you, no matter what your character is going to have some proficiency to use to defend themselves uh Cleric also can change this a little bit as well, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, defenses tells you what kind of armor you can wear. Clerics start off untrained in all armor, though they are trained in unarmored defense. As well, uh, the cleric gets access to a spellcasting proficiency based on a tradition of spellcasting. There's four traditions. There's divine, primal, arcane, and occult. The cl the cleric is a divine caster, so they're trained in divine spell attacks and spell DCs. So now that you kind of got the general gist of the class, we're going to say we're going to select a class here, or we're going to select cleric here, and you can see our stats kind of did change from before we got plus one to wisdom. And now we're going to go through the general ABCs. This is going to be really easy. Very simple. So starting off, you're going to select an ancestry. Now, there are uncommon ancestries that you can select in this upper tab here and rare ancestries. Now, all ancestries, in my opinion, are balanced, maybe even not by initial features, but by the class's general feats that you have access to. For instance, human probably has one of the best feats or best starting sets of feats in the game, giving you access to extra feats that you can select for your class or maybe extra proficiencies. I wouldn't say human is by any means worse than like an android. But rare ancestries, and another thing to mention as well, uncommon and rare are mostly factors for society play. If you are in Pathfire society, you actually need to spend points to get special ancestries in this way, which means you need to go to uh, society play frequently enough to get those points and as well there also just tend to be more complicated classes or ancestries you can see here dwarf elf gnome they don't really have all that much but we go to like automaton here you got a wall of texts so my recommendation if this is your first character which if you're going to a character creation guide i'm sure is going to be your first one i would select either a common or uncommon ancestry Granted, getting permission from your GM for any uncommon ancestries you select. But as you can see here, the uncommon ancestries, besides a couple, are really not that complicated in comparison to like the common ones. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to select like, or we're going to look at one of them. We're looking at the dwarf here. So the hit points here are not based on your level. You only get this for selecting the ancestry once. 
and then never again. So when you start the game, you get your ancestry hit points plus your level one class hit points added together. So if you're playing a dwarf, you start with six. But if you're starting with an elf, you start or sorry, you start with 10. If you're starting with an elf, you start with six. You can also see the size of the classes determines how many squares they take up. Uh, they don't currently have anything larger than medium, but there are going to be large ancestries coming up soon. And all you need to know is that if it's a large creature, it takes up a two by two square on the map. And if it's a small creature, it is less than a square. And there are some factors that allow small creatures to, like, say, fit into places that medium creatures or larger can't. So it's something you want to keep in mind. Uh, you can also see here the ability boosts that each ancestry provides. And there's ability flaws, which is an which is something that you can change based on what your preferences are for your character. So you can see here the dwarf gives constitution and wisdom, which is good for our cleric, plus an additional free one. The free one can be any ability score you have not already selected. So it can even actually be your flaw here, which is charisma. And the flaw is a ability score that starts off at minus one rather than zero. You can see what languages your character could speak. Your character knows a number of languages equal to your intelligence modifier, plus anything uh, left of this. So dwarves know common and dwarvish, plus an additional amount equal to their intelligence modifier. Uh, and then you can see here that dwarves start with dark vision. Most ancestries don't have dark vision. So if you're coming over from D&D, &D, just know most class or most ancestries do not. So having dark vision is actually pretty valuable in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Not anything I would say that is worth picking an ancestry over, but something to keep in mind. So we're going to go ahead and select the dwarf here. And now we're going to look at backgrounds. Now, there are a metric ton of backgrounds in the game. The, the backgrounds are not anything that I would say are overly important. The biggest thing about each background that you should know is that it will provide you with two ability boosts, typically. And it'll be an ability boost that is one of a selected two, and then typically a free boost. As well, each of these will give you an extra skill proficiency and typically a lore skill, which lore skills are a skill that represents the knowledge your character has on a very specific subject. Plus, you'll typically get a skill feat as well. Skill feats are feats that augment the use of your skills, and they're actually a pretty big part of Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Now, there's only two classes currently that get a skill feat at every level, though there is classes like the Swashbuckler that gets additional feats as they go, but most other classes will only get access to 10 skill feats throughout the game. So something you might want to keep in mind as you're selecting your skill feats as they're rather limited and they can make a big difference. Uh, the difference between being able to grapple a large creature can be just decided by a singular feat. So you're going to select any background that is going to give you skill choices that you want or ability scores that you want plus skill choices that you're you're after. Now, similarly, as I mentioned before, there are uncommon and rare backgrounds as well. I don't recommend selecting any rare background for your character as they tend to be a bit more complicated. They don't have this standard structure. And uncommon, it ranges. Most of them are pretty fine. They give you most of the same stuff, though they might have some lore implications. So something you need to ask your GM for sure. For the sake of this, we're going to select an Acolyte because we're a Cleric. This will give us Intelligence or Wisdom and a free boost plus reli uh, Religion and a lower scale. Now, because we're going to be trained in Religion already for being a Cleric, this will actually just transfer into a generic scale. So we're going to select that. And now that we're done with the basic parts, we're going to select our level one. And first, we're going to look at our ability scores. So. This is where you select the boosts you get from your prior options. 
The ancestry you can see here provides constitution, wisdom, and a minus to charisma. We could select charisma if we wanted to. And even if you mess up and say you select something like, oh, you can't do it here. Uh, you can do it in the background. So I'll, I'll talk about it then. But for all intents and purposes, if you don't like the penalty you get or the standard, everyone has the option to use the alternate variant rule which just allows you to pick two boosts no flaws no additional benefits so it doesn't really matter what ancestry you pick in the end you're probably going to have a character that is very functional for what you want them to function as now the background you can see here the left option will give you the one of the two and the right option will give you any of the other ones now if Say we're a cleric, so we're going to take wisdom, but we take wisdom here. You're going to get an option that says illegal background boosts. You cannot select the same boost twice in any uh, part of the character creation process. So you're going to have to change this one to another one. We're going to select strength as we're going to make a, like a war priest character. And then after all that, you get your class boost and four free boosts that you can put into any ability score granted one only once each so we're going to select strength con uh, wisdom con and we're going to add to our character sheet a dex point for extra ac and you can override character creation ability scores if your character your group is doing something different like rolling for stats however you want to do that we're going to click finished here and now we're going to look at our skill training proficiencies you can see here that the ones that are highlighted are already selected. And you can see our proficiencies on the right hand side here. So our character is good at wisdom. So we might want to select wisdom skills. Uh, I'll select a athletics point here. And then I'll select medicine as well and give us some more healing options. Now you can see here if I try to select any of the other ones that we already have, we can't upgrade that ability score, so it keeps track of that kind of stuff. Pretty good. Uh, the deity skill. Now, if you're playing something like a cleric, you're going to need to use either a core book or you can use a website that's called Archive Anethys that you can select right here. This will give you a list of options. If you want deities, you're going to go to setting and you're going to click deities here. And then you're going to see all the deities. You can read up on them, see what you're looking for. Archive of Nethys is a wonderful site that gives you every rule in the game currently available. So even if this is your first game, you don't even actually need a core book to play, though this does having a core book is recommended just because the rules are going to be something you're going to have to search. While in the remasters that are coming out, they're going to be laid out in a very easy to access fashion. So Archive of Ethos is a handy tool, but it doesn't replace a core book, even though you can find all the rules here. So back to Path Builder, uh, we're just going to select Acrobatics. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. Whatever your deity gives you, you would select for a cleric. Now we have one extra. This extra came because we had religion already from our background and from our class so we're just going to put out nature boom easy it already it already adds up all your skill and all your skills here plus their modifiers and everything so you don't need to do anything extra but let's say we want to look at what our acrobatics gets you can see that we're getting one point from our decks three points from our proficiency because we're trained which gives you plus two and our level is currently one, so it gives you a plus three. And you can see here by selecting this as well, everything that the skill is used for. So if you haven't selected your skills yet, you can actually click each of them to see what they're used for, different kinds of actions. And you can expand these to see what those actions do. A really good feature, honestly. Now, heritage is something you typically select normally when you're selecting your ancestry. A heritage comes with every ancestry and it pretty much gives you some additional features from your from your character's selected ancestry. As you can see here, the common ones are all the base ones for being a dwarf.
but the uncommon or rare ones are called versatile heritages. Versatile heritages means your character is like a half breed of something else, like you're a damn fire or you're a ASMR, which is actually going to be changed soon. ASMR and Tiefling are going to be replaced with the Nephilim, so you don't need to worry about that. Also, you can see uncommon and rare, so something to keep in mind. Uh, for all intents and purposes, we're just going to select one of these. You can read what each of them do. Typically, in a heritage gives you access to like an extra ability or so. Granted, I will say that the versatile heritages will give you access to extra feats. Uh, so I'll actually select one of these here. We'll go with Damfire. Why not? And then your Ancestry feat. So you click Ancestry feat. It gives you all the level one options. Anything higher than level one you can see here is in gray. So you cannot select these. And as well, there are some uncommon ones. So you need to ask your GM's permission. But you can read through each of these and pick something that goes really well. I'm a very big fan of the whatever ancestry weapon familiarity. Since we're playing something like a, cl a cleric, they don't get a ton of weapon proficiencies. This can give them actually a lot of weapon proficiencies and access to unique weapons to dwarves. They get access to dwarven weapons. One of my favorites, so we'll select that one. Your divine font is a class feature of the cleric. We're not going to worry about that. I'm just going to select healing font here. It's based on your deity, so you don't need to worry. And your doctrine, this is where you would select your subclass for whatever class you're going with. We're going to go war priest just for this case. And then your deity's favorite weapon, we're just going to say battle axe. There we go. So this is everything you can see here as well. This will give you all the additional stuff for your class available on the side that you can read, plus your ancestry stuff like low light vision or dark vision because we're a dwarf. And we also get access to a unique feat shield block for being a, well, not unique, but it's a, a, we, we get access to an additional feat being a war priest, which is shield block. So that is pretty much the basics for character creation, though you do start with 15 gold. So I'm just going to run down real quick how to add special uh, certain items to your spell or to your character sheet here. And uh, this automatically is set to auto save. So it doesn't matter any options we're doing here get saved. So if you accidentally close the window, for whatever reason, your character should be saved. So you start with 15 gold. One of the things you might want to grab first is the adventures pack. The adventures pack contains a bunch of stuff that adventurers need, including rations and the like. You can buy it, and the site comes with an option already selected called separate adventures kit into individual items. So you'll see here that we've got the adventures kit, we got a backpack, and all these items here. You can even rearrange these if you really want to. I guess you can't. Oh, you have to edit. There you go. Doesn't really matter. Uh, and then you're going to probably want to slide some weapons and gear. So you can add a weapon. You can see on the left hand side here if the weapon is one that you're trained in. When you are starting out the game, you only have access to any of the gray weapons here and weapons that are level zero or one. Though, because we are playing a class that could get access to unique weapons, or because we're a dwarf, we might also get access to other weapons here, depending on how our character pans out. So we our favorite deity weapon is the battle axe. So we can select the battle axe here. And then you would hit buy. This will automatically subtract from your gold, as you can see here on your, your gear page. And the weapon is automatically equipped. Now, if you are adding additional weapons to your character sheet, don't forget that anything you put here is considered equipped. So if you want to put one in your bag, you actually hit the stow option and it will appear in your main inventory section. And if you want to restore it back to your character's equip slots, you hit restore and it'll jump back here. For defenses, 
you can see here what armor proficiencies you're trained at the top. <coughs> it also tells you the base, which is 10 plus the item bonus, plus your dex modifier, plus proficiency. And then the armors will change individually. So let's say we're, we select a, a breastplate, right? So we're going to buy this breastplate. This has an item bonus of plus four and a dex cap of one. So even if our dex modifier was higher, we'd still only benefit from up to one. And you can see here, our character AC has already been updated on the character sheet. Now, if you try to add a different, or uh, if you try to add a armor that you're not trained in, I'm gonna hit give here, which just does it for free for your character. You can see that we're not trained. We have this U here, which means untrained. And you can see here, it gives us an item bonus of six, which we do keep, but we don't get our proficiency, which it shows all the changes up here as well. And you can see our AC is actually less. Now, something that is easy to mess up on your character sheet, I gave us another armor piece, but our prior one did not go into our inventory, even though we paid for it. So anytime you are selecting a or getting a new piece of armor, make sure you stow your, your old armor first and then equip your new one. If you're buying it from a shop, for instance, this just makes it so you don't lose access to armor that you already had before which there you go you can see the full plate that i gave here is on the character sheet and of course if you want to add a shield to your defenses you can do so uh, i think buckler is yeah let's see steel shield should be good yeah should be good so you can buy a steel shield you can give it now you can see that even though we have a shield it's not added directly to our ac in pathfinder second edition Shields do not give an automatic increase to your AC. Instead, you need to use the raise shield action, in which case you'll get this circumstance bonus to your AC. So you, you need to use one action to raise your shield, which gives you a plus two. That'll make our AC 20. And you can see here, you can hit raise to raise for that plus two. And that lasts until the beginning of your next turn. And then you can unselect it there. And yeah, after that, it's pretty easy. If you want to add any other spells to your character sheet, you can select any of these and you can select any of the ones that you have access to. And as well, if you're adding a slotted spell, it will also only limit you to the spells you could select at that level anyway. And it makes managing your character really easy. Plus, you can see your character spell attack and spell DC up here at the top. So that was a very comprehensive full character guide to character creation in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Hopefully this all helped you out. Path Builder is a really good site. Archive and Ethos is also another really good site for your character creation needs. And as well, both of these will be taking the remaster rules into consideration. You can see here that there's not modifiers. Granted, if you do click this, it says total. Ignore this. Totals don't matter anymore. We're not using that anymore. All that matters is modifiers so that's gonna be it and then you can select actually on this one your feats early and it won't change your character sheet until you actively level your character up uh some other features as well you can see all the feats you've selected on the feats page and all basic actions or actions you have access to on the action page as well plus you can manage any of your companions islands or familiars if you have them though you only get access to this if you have the full app unlocked so you'll need to spend six dollars to get that which is very unfortunate especially because it's a key feature for something like the summoner but honestly you can find all the rules for idolins and such on the class section of archive and ethos you can see here you can click idolins and then you can click boom full rules and islands and you can just record this on another sheet if you don't want to pay for Path Builder. Hopefully this helps. Let me know down in the comments if this really helped you all out. And hopefully this gets to people who really need it. Anyway, that's going to be it for me. Thank you all so much for watching. Good luck with your games. Leave the bad luck to me. And I'll see you all next time. Bye.